Hi! In the previous video I introduced you into the miracle of linguistic variety. There are so many different languages in the world and we cannot even count them. And I introduced you into one of the most important resources we have for studying linguistic variety in the world and in ind individual countries, the so-called Ethnologue website. I'm now going to discuss topics like this more with my students Martin and Inge. So I first have a seemingly stupid question about linguists and ethnologue. Um, is that just the tool that they use? Do linguists just sit at their desk all day looking at ethnologue? Yes, typing on the word and trying to see on this website. No, that would indeed be a little bit silly, I think. Uh, one, for one thing, obviously there's also linguists who make the ethnologue uh, website, so they would definitely do something else. But actually linguists do many different things. I think this is one of the nice things about being a linguist. You can work in many different kinds of places. The famous American social linguist William Labov once said, linguists work in five different fields, in five different areas in the world. They work in the library, they work in the bush, they work in the closet, they work in the laboratory, and they work on the street. And I think that's a very nice distinction and maybe we can discuss these five a little bit more now. Okay, so the first was library. So I would expect a linguist who works in the library to look at books to work with books, maybe history books? Right. I have to say Labov said this in the 1970s, so this was really before the internet. So I think looking in the ethnologue would be something which you would do in the library at that time as well. And looking in the internet now is counts as being in the library mm -hmm. sometimes. Sure. But it is indeed associated with looking into reference works. An important group of linguists who uses the library a lot are so-called historical linguists. They are the people who study, well, the history of an individual language or the way in which languages are related in language families. They can also study the way in which language is used, for instance, in literary work. Those are called philologists. They may sometimes be called linguists, sometimes not, but if we're a bit ecumenical, then we can say they are linguists as well. But indeed, so that's a, that's a large group, it's an important group, it has been the traditional place where linguists work, okay. the library. So they also work in the bush? I was thinking, what does this mean? Does it mean like there are linguists who go to faraway places, in the bush maybe, <laughs> who try to find new languages or try to describe them or...? Right, well, yes. So th these are very admirable people, I think. They go indeed to difficult places, uh, usually, to study languages which are new in the sense that we don't know anything about them. And for most of these six, seven thousand languages of the world, we hardly know anything. Because they're spoken in areas where people are difficult to reach. They're spoken by small groups of people. Most, the large majority of the languages has really not been described. Maybe we know a handful of words. And that's actually a problem given that many of these languages seem to disappear. Mm -hmm. So there, people say they're going to disappear over the next hundred years. Maybe in a hundred years from now we only have a few hundred languages left. We may not want these languages to be gone without leaving any trace, because they can give us a lot of information about what l human language can do. So it's a pity for us as linguists if they disappear. Mm -hmm. It might also be a pity for the people involved. Very often these people move to some kind of dominant, often European language. For instance, in Brazil they might move to Portu Port Portuguese, or in uh, Indonesia they might move to Indonesian. And they do so for good reasons, namely they want to have a good career or want to give their children a good career opportunity. But it's a pity that these languages are lost, lost sometimes because 
their children in the end might want to go back to their roots and want to know more, at least know more about it. If you haven't written anything, we will never know anything more about it. So this is a big concern to a very large group of linguists nowadays, to try to transcribe and describe the languages of the world. These languages, as I said, they are very often spoken, well the bush is just one kind of term, but they're spoken in areas which are not very easy to reach. People go there and spend a few years of their life to describe these languages and live with those people. And that's another thing which linguists do. It's a very different area than working in the library, of course. And I think it's also very different from working in the closet, right? I think maybe from the list, that one was the one that puzzled me most, because in the closet, well, what would someone do there? Presumably you're alone because there's not a lot of space <laughs> and you're, you know, you have tunnel vision that some project that you're working on in, in solitude. So well, what, what, what would you think that a linguist does in the closet? Well, right, probably. Right. Well, okay. That's so that's obviously something that every scholar needs to do at some point. So in that sense, it's clear that every scholar needs a closet. But there's also many linguists who spend their time in the closet, for instance, because we need a lot of thinking. We have already seen, just in the few videos before, we have seen that there's many puzzles about human language. There's many things we just don't understand. And in order to understand them, you might want to be alone or with a colleague together and just sit behind your desk and think. Or you might want to write a grammar of an individual language. So if you think, that's what we typically call a theoretical linguist. If you write a grammar, you would be a grammarian, or, or, uh, or obviously. Grammarians are often theoretical linguists as well because they spend their time in this closet. Again, there's a large group of linguists who spend their life like that. If you're describing just your own language, if you're describing the language which you speak every day, and there's many things, there's no language which has been described completely. English, obviously, is a language on which many people have worked. Mm -hmm. The grammar of English has been described really fairly well. And still there's things we don't know. Still linguists can spend their time working on it. Mm -hmm. If they speak English as their native language, they don't need to go to the bush to find other people who speak that. They can just consider their own knowledge about mm -hmm. these languages. So linguists can easily spend their life in the closet as well. Okay, and other linguists work in the lab? Yeah. This seems an interesting place. I was wondering, what are they doing there? I, I can imagine that you need, if you want to study language in a lab, you need people. So, and what happens? What can you do? <laughs> you have to make them speak? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, if you think about language in the lab, yeah, you're probably going to bring in people into that lab because they will produce the language. And you also need some machines, right? So do you have any idea about what kind of machines they could be? Well, I, I'd say computers and microphones and that kind of... Yeah, so microphones is obviously a good thing. So there's phoneticians. We're going to look a little bit into that next module. Uh, phoneticians who study speech sounds, so you can record those speech sounds and then typically put them in the computer and study them in detail. Exactly what do you do when you, produ when you produce these sounds? How do these sounds look like and how are they different from one speaker to the next? So that's one thing you can do. There's another big group of linguists. They're usually called psycholinguists. So they study linguistics in combination with psychology or from a psychological point of view. So the way in which people in their mind work with language. Very often, they also work in a lab. In the lab, again, they put people, maybe they put a computer and they do little tests with the people on, the, on, on that computer, right? So it's languages which we already know, but we don't know how exactly people behave, 
how they react to words, how fast can they recognize a word when they see it. Well, if you have very precise technology, you can see that. Okay. And maybe there's a third kind of lab, which is interesting nowadays. You can also put people in a brain scanner and look into their brain and see what happens there when they use language. If language is something which is so specifically human, there must be certain things in our brain which are specifically human and which go on when we are using language. That's something you can study. So the lab is indeed, as you say, a very interesting place. It's an interesting place to uh, be. It's a place where linguists have learned many things about how language works. Yes, yes and Labov's final point was at the street, so linguists work on the street. So I can imagine that there are linguists who just go on the streets and who listen very carefully <laughs> what the customer says to the butcher and the butcher says to the customer and vice versa. Right, but yeah, so, you'd, so you could say the street, in that sense, the street is like the bush, mm. but it's just a little bit closer to home. But what, uh, what Labov meant specifically with the street is not just to describe one language, but he is very interested in these small differences. So if the butcher talks to the customer, do they speak differently? Or does the butcher speak differently to the customer than to his mother? Well, the answer is probably yes, unless his mother is his customer. So, um, and that's small variation, and those are things which people find interesting as well, and about where we can learn many things, because these small variations, they're very tiny, but, well, they may end up being as big as the difference between French and Italian. So from studying that, we can also learn how languages start varying at a larger scale. So now that we've seen all these five things, um, everybody, of course, wants to be a linguist after taking this course. So where do you think would be best for people to go? Yeah, would it be best to be a linguist in the library or would it be best to be a linguist, well, in one of these other uh, places? Labov said, and I think he is completely right in that, we need all five of those. In this video, we have seen that linguists work in many different kinds of areas in the world. In the next video, you are going to do some field work yourself. But don't worry, you don't have to go into the bush. You can just do this behind your desk, in the library or in your closet. <laughs>